Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Well, welcome and uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you've all had a pleasant lunch. Funnily enough, I wasn't very hungry. <laughs> it was about a year ago uh, that John Sesford asked me to give, uh, give the producer's talk at the conference. And of course, I was, I was naturally flattered and willingly agreed at the time, but that was a year ago. And as the days got closer, I thought, why the hell have I, did I ever say yes? What can I possibly tell the audience at the Befrepa conference how to produce eggs? However, I do think the interchange of ideas amongst producers is one of the, uh, one of the most positive ways we can improve productivity, uh, as we all benefit from each other's experiences. So at John's request, I will share with you some of the quirky things I do and the reasoning behind it. Firstly, me, just briefly, my background, as, as John mentioned, I was a pig farmer. Come the mid-2000s, I uh, moved out of pigs and into free range. I was told at the time that, <laughs> as the packers gave out the contracts, that free range would never get into the same situation as pigs and dairy, where producers were locked into systems of unprofitable production. So I've done it for five years now, and I've already had one good year. <laughs> so at least in that respect, it's a bit better than the pigs. Well, I had a good look at the packers in my area, and a good look round existing units, and I talked to other producers. Uh, in fact, there was hardly a unit I didn't visit in the North East. Uh, <coughs> and I would like to public thank, publicly thank them all for their openness and their help when I was doing my research. Uh, I applied for planning permission, and I applied for a bank loan. I was successful on both fronts and decided to give it a go. Now, I was very impressed when I saw my first multi-tier in 2008, and I decided to go down that route. I then thought I'd better learn a little bit about hens, and I attended a poultry veterinary course with Alistair Johnson, our next speaker. And the hens duly arrived in May 2009, and that's, as we all know, is when you really start to learn. It's a bit like passing your driving test, isn't it? It's only when you've passed your test, you learn to drive. And so it was with the hens, and I would say I'm still learning. And I'm now uh, week 54 of my fifth crop. The, uh, this is the obligatory picture of my hens. Of course, the range always looks like that. <coughs> You've got to be pretty quick if you're going to take a picture like that because within about uh, half an hour it's completely trashed. <laughs> now this is a picture which I've put on because this was taken by a professional photographer um, for a new label on the Morrison's egg box. They were trying to take a picture similar to the one that they'd photoshopped on the existing label. Believe it or not, it took two of them six hours to get that picture. They were concerned that the, the label could have been taken as a misrepresentation uh, of the contents of the box, and they wanted a, an authentic picture of free range. So I s tapped him on the shoulder and said, why don't you have a look at what's happening behind you, <laughs> <coughs> where the hens have been locked out whilst they were taking the picture. He said, no, I don't think that would be suitable for what we're looking for. <laughs> the graphics wouldn't fit round the hens. So, the, uh, and that was a shot just after he left and we moved the fence and let the hens back in. Um, I said, well, why don't you take a picture inside the shed? That might be more appropriate to what free range is nowadays. He declined that as well. And this is a shot of one of my hens, <laughs> one wet night. Um, and these are a couple of shots of my paddock entrance last week. As you can see, not a blade of grass in sight. And that was a birthday card I got last year, which I thought was quite appropriate in the presentation. <coughs> I think this is just an indication of the wider issues with the branding of free range. 
but it's got nothing to do with my talk. I intend to talk solely about the things I, as a producer, can influence. Now, my sole reason for getting into free range was, funnily enough, to make some of this. I'm doing free range purely for commercial reasons. And I know free range eggs may have a humanitarian appeal, but we all need our hens to leave a profit, I presume. Does anyone not need a profit? Can I put it another way? Who in the audience needs to make a profit? Can you put your hands up? <laughs> the, uh, in that respect, Keith Wilde's costings in the Ranger, which I have to say are a pretty true reflection of my costs, show a pretty dismal reading over the last few years. And he's even had to take the finance charges out so they don't look so ridiculous. However, I unfortunately live in the real world where finance does have a cost. And I also acknowledge reality, and that what I produce is a commodity. And as such, the price is a function of supply and demand, and is not related to the cost of production. So how to make a profit from free range? I did think I could entitle this talk, How to Make a Small Fortune Out of Free Range. You start with a large one. Firstly, and sadly, I'll never get there simply by cutting costs. First of all, costs are pretty fixed anyway. They're, they're cut to the bone on any farm. I've had nearly 40 years now in livestock production, and I've spent years trying to cut costs. All that tends to happen is that uh, the output drops as the stock do not get the attention that they, requ they require or they deserve. As I said, most of my costs are fixed, even feed. Only 20% of the cost of feed goes into egg production. The shed costs the same whether it's full or it's empty, etc, etc. The only way for me as a free range producer to increase my margin is to increase output. And in my case that means eggs per bird housed. I realise that egg weight in seconds does have a small influence but nothing like the numbers do. So the only way that I will achieve uh, a profit is to consistently achieve above average production. Not just the odd crop, but every crop. And there's no blueprint for good production. If there was a manual, I'm sure it would sell like hot cakes. There's so many influences in the free range environment. So I think we need to build on our own experiences and the experience of our fellow producers to get this knowledge of what's behind the, produce, the, the numbers game. And all this knowledge and experience, in my case, comes from six main areas. The, uh, firstly, there's the hen. She can tell you a lot about what's ha happening if you monitor things closely enough. I record as much information on a daily basis as I can. Usual stuff, such as egg weights, egg numbers, water feed consumption, blood teeters, fecal counts, everything you can name. I remember Kenny Shaw from Loman GB when I first started telling me, Phil, you need to know what's happening in the flock before the hen knows. And I think that was pretty good advice. Secondly, there's the packer. I chose Chippendales. It's a personal choice. I chose them mainly because of their flexible contracts. I didn't want to get locked into long-term contract. I had too much experience of those with the pigs. I chose someone I felt I could work with. After all, he's going to be my customer. And I think the producer-packer relationship is a lot more than just a business deal. Because we both need a spirit of openness and fairness. And I just felt that Nick Jippendale and this man, Peter Chignall, were people I could get on with. Peter's highly experienced in the industry and he's become a bit of a mentor to me. And all this is a two-way process. He helps me with production issues and hopefully I produce the egg he can sell. The next person who helps is of course the feed manufacturer. In my case it's um, four farmers. Um, I think you need complete trust in your, in your nutritionist. I have implicit trust in Andrew Fothergill. I'm often on the phone suggesting odd tweaks to rations 
and he's ably assisted by David Brightmore. There's the pullet rearer. I use country fresh pullets, so essential to get the pullets off to a good start. And this man, John Mason, he's an absolute fund of knowledge. Probably knows too much. <laughs> Again, he's been in the industry man and boy, and he loves to share his experiences for our benefit. Probably the most influential of my advisors are my vets. I think it's essential you have someone at the top of their game. It's critical that my vaccination intervention strategies are appropriate for my unit. And I chose Minster. And I apologise to Sarah for the picture. The, um, and then there's the breeder. Uh, the current crop of Lomans. So I get visits from Jamie McIntosh, who's well experienced and helps me achieve my targets. However, the guy on his right, on his left, uh, Rudy Preisinger, he's the head geneticist and MD of Lohman Tearhooked. And he is the man who puts the lime in the coconut. All the hen geneticists have made so much progress with the genetics of our raw material in recent years. They've made huge leaps forward in the productivity of the hen. And Rudy lent me these following two slides to illustrate that. The first one illustrates the improvements in eggs per hen per year and over an egg per year over the last 50 years. In other words, my current crop have a genetic capability of producing five and a half more eggs than my first flock. I find that astounding. And the other thing is this is an out ongoing process. This rather complicated slide shows that 3% of the hens laid an egg a day for 200 days in the pure lines. So it's an ongoing process. They still have a lot of genetic material in the pyramid to continue with this progress. So I see my role as being the person that puts all this information together, mixes it all up, and comes up with a strategy for profitable production. I'm the one that has to pay the bills, therefore I decide on the interventions. I should I'll just digress a little bit and highlight what I think are the five attributes of a hen that are very obvious but they're often overlooked. Firstly, it's avian. So it can fly, it has very small lungs. Alice had told me all about this. The, um, <coughs> and it works by a system of turbocharging the lungs. Uh, so there isn't a huge surface area for gaseous exchange. Secondly, it's derived from a jungle environment. Very humid and pathogens and dust are precipitated out. I don't know whether you recall the old sweat boxes for pigs, but one of the reasons they were so successful, the thought that the pathogens were getting precipitated out by the humidity. But maybe its predecessors did not lead to develop comprehensive defence mechanisms uh, to capture the pathogens we expose them to. The third point I want to make is that we're involved with a very complex process in egg, in egg production. It's not as simple as putting muscle on. The, uh, <coughs> it's a complex hormonal, hormonal process that can easily go wrong. But having said that, it's the most basic instinct of all life. Without it, there is no life, of course. And all we have to do as producers is to encourage it to do what it naturally wants to do. And sometimes I think we as producers just put obstacles in its path. The next point is that, despite what the marketers would tell us, that a hen is unable to make reasoned judgments. We have to work with what we've got, and we can only work with its natural instincts. And lastly, it's female. Now they always need careful handling. They don't always act in a logical manner. I don't want to get involved in a sexist debate, but probably ladies make better stocks people because they're more in tune with their stock. And I think a good stocksman 
needs to have that element of care and consideration, as in any relationship. And we call this good husbandry. Now, there's not a tick box for good husbandry in the Lion Code or the Freedom Food Audits. But I think it's essential if I'm going to achieve above average sustainable production so I can make my profit. And unfortunately, you do not get good husbandry by cutting costs. It needs investment. So in my view, there's so many variables to achieve, achieve sustainable above average production, there are no shortcuts. Might get lucky with the odd crop, but to get sustainable above average production, it can only come from the day in, day out attention to detail. And that attention to detail will hopefully provide the right environment for the hen to thrive and fully express its genetic potential. And in fact, when you break it down, I think there's three environments which uh, contribute to good husbandry. There's inside the shed, outside the shed, and the hen itself. So as far as the environment inside the shed, this is a sign on the door to my poultry shed with health and, health and safety insisted I put on to protect me and my staff when we venture in. Now the hens have to live in that, that environment all the time. And of course we don't give them masks, thankfully. <laughs> um, I was talking to a broiler breeder producer, Richard uh, Smalden, who said he knows when the atmosphere is right in his shed, when he can go in, sit on a bale of straw, have his lunch and read the newspaper. In other words, the atmosphere was right, the lighting was right. I've often th that's always struck me, and um, what I do, because it's multi-tier, I muck out twice a week, I remove any cap litter, I remove surplus floor litter just to try and remove odour. And odour's never really talked about, but I assume a hen does have a sense of smell. He also de-dusts the shed daily to reduce the pressure on the respiratory tract. Remember, the hen has very small lungs. It can't, have lo can't afford to lose any of its surface area. Now I come from just south of the Durham coal fields. The miners that used to work in the pits had no lung, lung problems when they were young was only when they retired. So maybe that's why we see so many units struggle at the end of lay. They haven't cared for the environment at the start of lay. Also, what's it like at night with the pop hole shut? Is there an odour issue? After all, the night is a third of its day, if you know what I mean. Um, <coughs> is it conducive to a good night's sleep? because the hen's still working away producing an egg. Next, the range environment. That's a shot of my range. When the hens have come out, I use paddock rotation. I rot rotate the paddocks every five weeks. But when the hens move out, I actually plough the paddock and I reseed it. And I just try and reduce the bacterial loading that's going to challenge the hens. Try to keep the soil healthy by encouraging the natural bacteria in the soil to break down the faeces and get the grass to grow so the roots can take up the nutrients and put a bit more life into the soil. And it also, when the grass gets growing, it can <laughs> sort of provide a bit of a mud, uh, a, a mat above the mud. I'm not quite sure if it's worth it, to be honest, but I do what I can. It doesn't cost a lot. This is the sort of condition I try to get the paddocks in before the hens go in. I know it only lasts about a week in the summer and about two hours at this time of year, but the, uh, I just feel that we do spend a lot of time cleaning the sheds and we pay a little attention to what's happening outside. And lastly, there's the, the hen environment. Um, by this I mean building vigour in the hen. I use autogenous vaccines in rear. Um, I'm constantly on, in touch with Bridgeway regarding whether I should fine tune them. It does give Alistair and Sarah quite a headache on how to fit the vaccines into the 16 week rearing period. But I think it's essential to uh, give them as much protection as possible. 
I use IB vaccines in lay. I have an absolute zero tolerance of red mite and worms. And I haven't found an easy way to control the red mite yet. If anyone has, please share it. At present, I go in weekly, about two hours after lights out, with an insecticide and a monitor numbers and a spray. Then about once a month we spray under the slats uh, and that just about keeps them at bay. I think we need the correct nutrition and certainly clean water. Um, and it's all aimed to maintaining this gut health issue. So all this is designed to reduce the disease pressure on the bird they allow it to be robust enough to shrug off the challenges that are bound to come in the free-range environment. And to, to assist with this, to reducing this disease pressure, of course, I have to make appropriate and timely interventions when the production dips. These, this graph is uh, from Egg Base, which is um, uh, from Anne Fleck. Chippendale producers use it to benchmark against each other and against their own flocks. And if you can see this, the, uh, the red line at the top is the current flock, and the green line is my target line. <coughs> the, um, it might be more obvious if I use the traditional sort of graph which we're all familiar with. And the blue line is my current crop, and the red line <coughs> is the breed standard. Now the point I want to make about this that if you're just looking at breed standards you wouldn't have made any interventions but you can see when production was dipping I made a couple of interventions and I've got production back on the target again. The point that um, the, the whole point is to try and create the right environment so that the hen can achieve its genetic potential. So I've got to read the tea leaves, it's more of an art than a science, as we all know every crop is different. And I feel the more information we put into the pot, the more chance we are of reaching the right diagnosis for the problem. And it generally takes quite a few phone calls to the rest of my gang before I decide which intervention to use. I just thought I'd finish off with a few financials from the last crop. I just did a little bit of number crunching on the factors which most influenced the profitability of my last crop. Of course, I've ignored the feed and egg prices because I have no influence on them. So, the t the fairly simply, the three main targets I have, of course, is eggs per bird housed to 72 weeks because everything just drops to the bottom line. But what is realistically achievable in a free-range environment? I think 340 is probably a bridge too far at present, even though the cage men are getting there. Um, but I've set my target at 330, which I hope to achieve. Then there's the longevity. It's a little bit harder to measure that advantage, because you have to turn around anyway bit trickier to manage but again I think the bird has the genetics to do far in excess of 72 weeks. My last flock lasted to 81 weeks and after a, a chat with Rudy Preisinger I've decided to try and pull this crop to 85 weeks. And the third thing I target is the quick turnaround. The downside of course is this is little resting but I'm present doing a three night turnaround and I don't think there's much advantage of going any less. The, um, so the financial rewards for increasing persistency, birds to uh, numbers to 72 weeks, well, I'm sure as we're all aware, I received about a pound a dozen for the last flock. So every egg, extra egg per bird was worth 1,333 pounds to me. So going from 300, which I've taken as an average production, to my target of 330, it would leave me 40,000 pounds for the flock. 
Secondly, increasing the longevity by keeping the bird in lay longer. The big uh, benefit is, um, is in uh, turnaround costs, uh, in saving the turnaround costs. So the, uh, that's assuming production holds up. I don't think it's something you can do on a whim. You need a lot of planning, uh, ordering in exploits, all these sort of things, and managing the egg weight and the production current clock, uh, crop. So this is what I reckon it cost me to turn around my last shop, uh, sh uh, crop. The pullers was 70,000. Autogenous vaccine was about four. It cost me £3,000 to clean the shed out. £12,000 to feed the hens before I got an egg. Uh, small eggs is against medium. I reckon it cost me 2800 And the lost production was about £10,000. In other words, that the point with the lost production is it wasn't making a contribution to overheads unless it's producing eggs. So all that comes to about 100,000, which is a ballpark figure used for turning around a 16,000 bird flock. So by reducing the, the turnaround times, I would save one turnaround every six years. Of course, that has to be offset against the possibility of poorer returns at the end of the crop. And I think it requires an extremely close liaison with your packer and his willingness to play ball. Um, I also, at the last crop, had the option of going into uh, processing up my sleeve if the shell quality did go. But that might not always be there. And then... Oh, sorry, I meant to use these slides earlier. So it would save me £16,600 annually in turnaround costs if I go to 85 weeks, because I would save that one £100,000 turnaround every six years. So then the last thing I'm doing is decreasing the downtime at turnaround. Alistair and I tend to disagree on some of the benefits here. <laughs> um, but if your margin over feed and chick for round figures is £10, and you have a 72-week cycle, that is producing £317 a day for my flock in contribution to overheads. So every day that shed is empty, I am losing an opportunity income, if you like, of £317. So if it takes four weeks to turn the shed round, you've got a loss in contribution of nearly £9,000. So the extra income from good husbandry, when you all add it up compared to average production of 300 eggs to 72 weeks, and a 72 week cycle with a two week turnaround, what does it all stack up to on an annual basis? So on an annual basis, by going to 330, do, doing the, going to 85 weeks, and then the quick turnaround, it's just short of 50,000 pounds. And maybe that leaves a little bit for the attention to detail. The problem is, of course, is which detail we pay attention to. Every crop's different. We need to keep reading the tea leaves and gaze into the crystal ball, wondering where the production graph will go. It's all part of the fun of free range, isn't it? So, in conclusion, I sit in my office doing the cash flow for the bank, gazing into my crystal ball. I estimate where I think the price of feed will go. I estimate where I think the price of egg will go. I estimate what production I can realistically achieve. Then I run it through the model. Then go back and I fine tune it. <laughs> Give the egg price a bit of a nudge up. Drop the feed price. Run it through the model. Still doesn't stack up. Then I realise I must go and have another look at my cost of production if I'm going to make a profit. It was Jean Baptiste Alphonse Kerr, the French novelist, who famously said, 
plus a change, plus say la même chose. The more things change, the more things stay the same. So I'll go home tonight and I'll look after my ladies. After all, I have a huge responsibility to the rest of the supply chain. I need to produce the egg that the uh, rest of the industry can work on to produce their margin. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Philip, thank you very much indeed. Now we'll overrun ever so slightly. A quick question from the floor if anybody wants to catch Philip on a good day. <laughs> no questions from the floor? Yes, there's one. Martin, thank you, Martin. Oh, it would be, wouldn't it? <laughs> Well, you, you rushed over your three-day turnaround, really. Could you give a little bit more detail of how the hell you do that properly? Get the biosecurity right, get the complete change and clean it down. I'd be fascinated to know. Um, Other than not sleeping, of course. Well, it was the, the first thing I was going to say, I don't sleep for, for three nights. Um, it's something I, I, you can't rely on contractors for a kick-off. Um, they just don't turn up. Um, we muck the shed out before the hens go out. Uh, we found that's a bit of a benefit, that saves half a day. Um, we, um, we also blow down as much as possible before we start wetting things. That saves a lot of time towards the end. Um, planning for the, for the depletion and the new hens coming in, it, you know, it takes three or four phone calls to make sure that things are on track. Um, it's just basically getting stuck in. Um, you know, it's, uh, we've, I've had a lifetime of washing pig sheds out. Uh, so me and, the, and Dave, who works for me, uh, we know what it's about. And we just get stuck in and, and do it. Uh, I do hire two extra washers in. Uh, and, um, you know, these great big things. And uh, they certainly blast the water out. Um, but yeah, it's just a matter of getting stuck in. Uh, the shed's actually that warm that it just all evaporates and it dries out pretty quickly. So uh, the, um, the, the, there's two, the, there is a slight benefit, I think, because I have a constant field challenge with IB793. And I think with doing the quick turnaround, <laughs> I maintain that challenge. Because uh, the hens can live with that, I think. They seem to, anyway. Uh, and maybe it gives a little bit of cross immunity to the other IBs. Um, but, um, yeah, it's all about careful, you know, careful planning. Thank you very much, Philip. I think, Martin, what he really is saying, he just wings it. Three days of sheer chance. Anyway, I'd just like you to show your appreciation for Philip giving up his time and presenting that very worthwhile paper. <laughs>